Megan Washington's voice is extraordinary. For your double time high. Still to this day, when I think about it, I get shivers. It's just flawless. My whole life, singing has been my happy place. No, have to Something that I thought I would always have. And that's why last year, when the magic sort of stopped and I couldn't figure out what was wrong, I quit and I had to find other things to do. For her, music and creativity isn't about satisfying the needs of others. She needs to be completely invested in what she creates and I respect her hugely for that. It was the beginning of a massive new chapter of my life and lots of wonderful things happened after that. Six years ago, the thought of doing voice acting work would have filled me with abject horror and dread. I just wouldn't have done it. I didn't. <laughs> but I do now. I am the voice of Calypso, the teacher on Bluey, which is an animated children's show. And the rain stopped and out came the sun. Ooh. Getting into the booth was pretty uh, intimidating at first. Sister rain has left and father's son is home. I think that what made it possible was the confidence and perspective uh, that I gained when I publicly came clean about the thing that I was hiding. I think it would be difficult for anyone to go public with any kind of personal thing, especially if you've spent so long disguising it or not drawing attention to it. She didn't tell me at all about what she was going to do at TED. My assumption was that she was going to sing. I had no expectation or knowledge of what she was going to do. I didn't know when I agreed to uh, to, to, to do this, whether I was expected to, to talk or to sing. But when I was told that the topic was language, um, I felt that I had to speak about something for a moment. I have a, a problem. It's not the worst thing in the world. I'm fine. I know that other people in the world have far worse things to to deal with, but for me, language and music are inextricably linked through this one thing. And the thing is that I have a stutter. So in five minutes, my husband and I are in tears. I sent her a text and I said, um, I couldn't be more proud of you than I am right now. Amazing. We love you, Mum and Dad. Looking back at either Spicks and Specs or even the chats I've had with, with Megan, at no point would I have even thought she had a stutter. So she's clearly done an amazing job of disguising it. It might seem t t curious, given that I spend a lot of my life on the stage. One would assume that I'm t t comfortable uh, in the public sphere and comfortable here speaking to you guys. But the truth is that I've spent my life up until this point, and including this point, living in mortal dread of public speaking. Public singing, whole different thing. <laughs> but we'll get to that in a moment. I was born in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. Uh, 
I lived there until I was 10 and a bit. Her father was a DJ, so there was always a lot of disco music around. Secondly, there was no television, so she watched a lot of MGM musicals and I think she knows the words to every show tune there is. My mother says that when I started school, I developed a, a stammer. And if I was to, pos to posit some sort of theory about it, I'd say that I, we, I learned to read very young. Like, I don't really remember learning how to read. I could just always sort of read. Um, and maybe something to do with reading, my reading ability, developing faster than my mouth, <laughs> mouth ability <laughs> or something. When I saw the very first speech therapist, um, that person kindly told me that um, children who stutter often have mothers who speak really quickly. So I sort of carried that guilt with me forever because apparently it's my fault. It, it gets the the word the word the, um, the worst that it is is when I read aloud. A slow red car. A slow I didn't want it to be the defining thing in our family sort of dynamics. There was still a million other things going on with her singing and her dancing. You think you're the way. I've got to get the police every not over. And yeah, I mean I, I always knew that I there was no there's no problem when I sing. Of course, I mean it encouraged me to sing m more. I mean for me like the stage was kind of a happy place, actually, um, because I wasn't me. And it still is a happy place, because I'm not like me. I'm me, but better. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was about 11 when my family moved from Port Moresby to Brisbane. The move for Megan was very difficult. Once we got to Australia, schooling became interesting, um, which is a, probably a delicate word for saying terrible. And that's when the bullying started because she was so different to other children at that time. The stutter was a part of the bullying, yes. The form of the bullying was just sort of general, all girls, ostracism, you're a bit weird, Megan. Um, and, I, and you know what I mean, I probably was. You're just too good to be true. Can't take my eyes off of you. And um, yeah, and I, I, I went to a performing arts school in year 11. And year 12, and I did good. I did drama, you know, and I and acting's a bit like singing. It's you don't really speech really isn't a bit of a problem. It's when you speak in an accent. I don't really stutter, or when I speak in a voice, you know what I mean, or in a character's voice. I wound up enrolling at the conservatorium. Studying uh, jazz, and at the same time, I was sort of gigging around Brisbane. I remember being quite shocked when I first saw her perform. Musically, it was stunning and mesmerising in all sorts of ways. But in between the songs, she was stuttering quite badly. And that continued for the whole gig, and it, it was almost as though she was having a mini breakdown mm -hmm. in between each song. Uh, Justin Bliss and Andrew Stone on the bass. I told you. I told you what happened. Uh, yeah, to the point where halfway through the gig, she started just turning her back to the crowd. She literally couldn't face people in between the songs. When I was singing a lot of jazz, uh, I worked a lot with a, a, a pianist whose name was Steve, as you can probably 
to gather S's and T's together or independently are my kryptonite. My friends told me about this incredible young singer, 19-year-old singer, and we went down to hear her singing at a club one night. One of the things that I noticed in conversation was that she had a tendency to stutter on certain sounds. Uh, and by the, when I got around to Steve, I'd often find myself stuck on the st. Um, and it was a bit awkward and uncomfortable and totally kills the vibe, you know. Um, so after a few instances of this, Steve happily became Steve. <laughs> and we got through it that way. It never really occurred to me that it might be something much more profound, much more traumatising, perhaps, for her. I've had a lot of therapy, and a common form of treatment is to use this technique that's called smooth speech, which is where you almost sing everything that you say. You kind of join everything together in this very sing-song, kindergarten teacher way, and it makes you sound very serene, like you've had lots of Valium, and everything <laughs> is fine. That's not actually me, you know. Over time, we started to, to play together. I'm clinging to the outside, like a patch sewn on your skin and it was very clear from the way that audiences were reacting to her that she was on a very, very fast, mobile, upwardly mobile trajectory. You know, there was going to be no stopping her. I'm letting trouble in, I couldn't tell you. I still can't, this might be the last beautiful day. Well, I guess, I mean, the problem for me with singing jazz exclusively was that it's not my story. They're great songs. Love all those songs. But then I started to really want to do my own thing. She was busily writing songs, and it was very clear to me that she stood the chance of being immensely popular on her terms. She started making video clips and things that were accessible on YouTube. And before very long, she had a growing following of people of her generation. When the first album came out, um, it was a hugely successful record for a debut artist. With the records coming out, of course I had to do more press, which I guess was more talking uh, potential for speech sort of problems. Are you presenting tonight? No way. No way. No, no. I, I didn't think you were. Public speaking. No, thank you. <laughs> Little speaking. Oh, little big, speaking, little yeah. Speaking, Bite big size. Speaking, big speaking, no. But, you know, I've been asked a few times to, to present ARIA awards or present APRA awards or speak at things, introduce people, and I just won't or can't. The, the thought of having to do that is like... <laughs> I mean, it's like... It's, it's like a... It's like a... Like a piano sitting on your chest, or on my chest. I don't think she's ever actually tried to disguise it, per se, but I do think that she has employed the smooth speech technique so that it's not obvious. I, I, I do use that. I, do, um, I use it when I have to be on um, pa panel shows, um, or when I have to do uh, radio interviews, when the economy of airtime is paramount. So I know for a fact that, Scott, you saw Megan perform in Adelaide. I did. Yeah, Fantastic. he told me he was in tears by the end of your concert. No, that's just because he's a massive girl. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm really surprised to learn that she still has a bad stutter problem because the amount of time I've spent talking to her, wow, either I'm really not very attentive or she does an amazing job of dealing with it. Oh, Mrs. Majesty. When I saw the King's speech, it really affected me, actually, just to see it portrayed so accurately. I mean, I kind of hated it. And I cried, of course I cried. The King. The reason that I hate t t talking about my s stutter so violently is because it's such a personal thing that it feels almost grotesque to discuss it um, because it's just such an intimate sort of struggle that I have with myself. Well, I only have one couch, so nobody can come to my house and play Scrabble because... In the last 12 months, I mean, she's been through a pretty tough time. Have you got any? Sage? And as a result of that, her start has been more noticeable. August of 2011, I moved to New York. I was pretty, pretty down. Maybe it was post-success crises. Once it's peaked, you go, what do, what do I do now? Like, what, what happens now? I think it can be hard when you're relatively young and you experience this relatively astronomic rise to success and to fame and, you know, for people to start recognising you on the street and um, I think there's a danger of losing yourself in that feeling. I think in New York, I was really lost, depressed, searching. And I made the decision to come home because I was finding it really hard to be myself, um, whoever that was, and I Started again, trying to f figure it all out. I kind of became compelled to do real things that are really scary. You know, I guess my biggest fear was public speaking. So I had that in my mind, and then along came an invitation for me to s perform at TEDx. And I was t t told that I had t 10 minutes to t perform. But given that it's a platform where most people t give speeches, um, I thought that maybe I should give one. TEDx is one of the conferences from the global set of conferences that look to inspire people with ideas. I was very surprised and excited, and I thought that it was going to be an amazing way to end the day. Megan showed up on the day, and she was a little bit nervous, as you can imagine, to the point that she almost decided not to do the talk at all and just do a couple songs. I've never really talked about it before so explicitly. I think that that's because I've always lived in hope that when I was a grown-up, um, I, 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 would, I wouldn't uh, have, have one. I sort of live with this idea that when I'm grown, I'll have learned to speak f French, and when I'm grow and I'll learn how to manage my money and when I'm grown I won't have a stutter and then I'll be able to public speak and maybe be the Prime Minister and anything's possible and, you know. <laughs> and it was amazing seeing so, this vulnerability of someone opening their mouth with an audience that's used to hearing these beautiful songs so eloquently sung, hear her stutter and stop. I could hear a pin drop. Uh, everyone was laughing, they were waiting for her next moment in her speech. Singing for me is sweet relief. It is the only time when I feel fluent. So I know that this is a TED 
talk, but now I'm going to Ted sing. <laughs> uh, this is a song that I wrote last year. Thank you very much. Thank you. And when she's done talking, she just walks over to the piano, opens her mouth. It blows my mind that someone can have a stutter and sing so beautifully two seconds later. It was cathartic. It was a really big thing for me to do for me, and I did it, and it was good. I thought it took a great deal of courage to do that, and to do it with such dignity and good humour. And I wonder if she realised at the time how she might be helping a whole bunch of people as well. Hanging out with Megan Washington this morning on Triple J. I probably won't to talk about it again, I don't think. I've d you know, I've done it now. And I, I didn't expect that it would be, be such a big thing. I mean, I made that speech because I wanted to empower myself. When I read aloud, um, I have a bit of a stutter. There you go. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I don't really want to be seen as an ambassador for it. Time to move on. Time to make more songs and sing them. After the TED Talk and the Australian Story episode came out, I was overwhelmed with correspondence from people everywhere, like everywhere. I didn't want to be a poster girl for stuttering, but I realised that doing that talk helped all these other people who were dealing with shame and anxiety about their speech. I moved to Berlin and that's when I began to make <laughs> the first of what would be three attempts to make another album. I scrapped the first record because it was too co-written and didn't sound like me. The second attempt at the record I made in LA and I didn't release that because it was so clean and perfect and I didn't hear myself in it again. She tried a different tack uh, and that didn't quite work out either. It was like a band-aid process that was trying to fix something that was already uh, not right. Meg didn't put out an album for six years, which is quite long in the music industry to be away from releasing a pop record. And I was like, well, maybe I just shouldn't make records anymore. So I stopped trying, actually. I just quit. And that's when I started to do the voiceover work for Bluey and narrated 10 episodes of a show called The Recording Studio. The iconic ABC recording studios are throwing open their doors. The first thing that I said when they asked me to do that, I was like, may I direct you to my TED talk? Please let me know if you still are considering me for this position because I feel that I may not be a natural choice. This is the recording studio. It took me <laughs> uh, quite a long time because I had to do a lot of um, takes because they all had stutters in them. Next singer to enter the recording studio is 24-year-old opera student Amy O'Neill. And I think just the more I did it, the easier it became. So by the end of it, I was just reading the lines on the page and it was amazing. Hello, I'm Megan. Galoomph went the little green frog one day. So at the same time as Meg starts branching out in all these other directions in her creative life, the frog went glump, glump, glump. She started a family as well. I met Nick and we got married, and uh, I had a baby. Our purple. Purple. All right. Light purple or dark purple? I went down that path of life, which is rich, rewarding, and very, very deep. <laughs> um, and 
challenging and, you know, um, all the things that it is. So that's been a part of the narrative too. In 2019, Warwick Thornton uh, approached me to compose the score for his documentary series, The Beach. I love what she does. And I didn't know what I wanted, really. I didn't know what kind of music I wanted. And I know she's so consummate that she could go down a sort of a, a, a sort of a, a really sort of foggy path with me, with the, with the, with the music, you know, she could do that. Um, she's, not, she's not stuck in some kind of genre. He basically just gave me the pitch, which was, it's me on a beach, there's no dialogue. I was so inspired that I went straight away to the piano and just improvised this thing that I recorded on my iPhone. When I first heard it, I teared up. I actually just teared up. It was just there. It was instantly there. It was just like it, it, everything about fear, everything about melancholy, anger, shyness. It had all of that in it. And I kind of, and, and I was like, well, that's it. Done. All right. And then I got the show. I got the actual eps and I sat down and I started to score it. I learned how to use a computer program called Logic that allows you to record yourself. And then I showed it all to Warwick and he didn't like it. I hated the second recording. I absolutely hated it. Well, I didn't hate it. It was just like, oh no. With love, he was like, what happened to all that cool stuff you were doing on your iPhone? And I um, went back and revisited all of that. So we put in the movie the, um, the original one that she recorded on her iPhone and it just fitted so perfectly. The great silver lining of that project with Warwick was that I had learned how to record myself. So this year, when um, COVID lockdown, like madness happened, and I decided to try to use that time to make the album, Again, um, I could. I wanna bring you good luck. Megan's latest album is the essence of what Meg is all about. Really smart songwriting, incredibly lush pop songs, and then moments where she's just recording on her iPhone, and that's what makes the record. Well, I knew it was finished because I could listen to it and like disappear and I didn't feel itchy, car sick, ah, regrets. I didn't, I didn't think, oh, I should have changed that lyric or none of that stuff. It was like, it just felt good and free and easy. You bring me bad flowers. The funny thing is, that's how I started making music, on my own terms. If Megan Washington had a motto, it would be never stop. Never stop looking for that spark of curiosity, the new sound that you haven't yet mastered. Her restless spirit will always drive her. Putting out that last record was terrifying, but I have this sort of life approach now, and it's largely to do with that TED talk, actually, which is that if I'm not terrified, I'm probably not trying hard enough and if I keep doing stuff that I'm scared of, I stop being scared of it. And then who knows what I might do. So you keep on going. So keep going. There are some interesting angles to having a stutter. For me, the worst thing that can happen is meeting an another Stutterer. Um, this happened to me in Hamburg when this guy we met and he said, hello, m m m m my name is Joe. And I said, oh, hello, m m m m my name's Meg. Imagine my horror when I realized he thought I was making fun of him. <laughs> <laughs>